Ours is an urban planet. The number of people living in towns now exceeds those living outside. When this milestone was reached in 2009, few people noticed. Across the globe, cities are growing upwards and outwards at unprecedented speed, fundamentally changing the way we live and work. This could be a golden age of architecture or a time of unrestrained commercial speculation. How our world will look for generations to come is being decided daily, and too few of us are engaging with the debate. In this supercharged world of instant communication, instant message and Instagram, we're too busy looking down. It's time for us to look up. I've spent over 12 years living in hotel rooms. And it is quite literally a suitcase, you and your toothbrush. So there's lots of time for reflection. All of the jobs that I've done have involved visiting huge mega cities. When you're in a city like that, you're surrounded by architecture. From the minute you open your hotel window and check out the view when you come into the room, to the moment you wake up in the morning and walk out on the street to see the customer. My day job's involved working with journalists who have had to come to grips with lots of new technology. So I kind of act as that human interface between this highly technical equipment and what somebody's trying to achieve creatively. I kind of came to a phase where I said to myself, you know what, Richard, it's time that you reinvested some of your own creativity and got something out of being in all these amazing places. I was always interested in composition and perspective, and I suppose that came out of studying art at college. And then came across some uh, time-lapse work. I thought, hey, do you know what? something I'd like to try doing. Time-lapse is a beautiful combination of still photography and filmmaking. Time-lapse shows the world in a state of altered reality. see how the world around you behaves in a way you cannot see with the naked eye. Time lapse is like magic. Of all the places I've worked in recent years, nowhere has changed more rapidly than Qatar's capital, Doha. A century ago, 12,000 people lived here. The population is now over a million, fueled by the oil and gas reserves. But if you look carefully at these buildings, you will see that few are occupied. Despite this, armies of foreign workers labor day and night to build more. Critics dismiss these newly minted Gulf capitals as instant cities. The inference being that they are mere facades, a reflection of national wealth and pride. Imported from the West, vanity projects for wealthy patrons and their overpaid foreign architects. In a country where nationals make up just 15% of the population, these prejudices are often reinforced for expats like me by the fact that you seldom, if ever, meet to locals. 
It took a friend of mine from London to introduce me to Fatima, a young Qatari architect who offered to show me the less visible side of Doha's current development boom. One thing I've noticed here is that most of the buildings appear to be empty still. Mm -hmm. So what's the purpose of building all these buildings, you know, without anybody to move into them immediately? What's, what's the grand vision? building a brand image for the city, but it's also an anticipation for this population growth that we already see taking place. Do you think people misunderstand what's going on in the Gulf right now? Definitely. Please. It's very apparent that all they see is the sort of, um, is the sort of, is the crust of, of the city and the crust of the society. This misunderstanding is not entirely surprising. When I look at these cities, I find it hard to see beyond the towers. Although Doha's buildings might not compete with Dubai's mega structures, they do draw the eye nevertheless, as they are meant to. But to me, skyscrapers make little sense in the Gulf. Their economic justification is based solely on the price of land. And there is no shortage of that here. It's amazing, I think, yeah. anywhere on the planet. Historically, people have lived in one or two-story houses. And judging by how empty the towers are, they're showing little inclination to change. Al-Azmak, in the heart of the old town, gives a sense of what Doha looked like before the discovery of oil and gas. Now, it too is marked for redevelopment. We selected some British architects who then worked with selected Qatari architects. They teamed up uh, to basically come up with proposals for this area, for old Doha. These neighborhoods have long since been abandoned by their original owners in favor of the less congested suburbs, becoming home to Doha's migrant workers. So how many years you are here? I told them, 40 years? I'm not 40 years. 40 years. Shukran. Fatima is part of a group trying to document Doha's past, before there's none of it left. In a city less than 100 years old, it's not always obvious what should be preserved. Oh my goodness, wow. Where is this you brought me to? This is one of the houses that I like to refer to as an endangered house. I think we're starting to lose big portions of the older parts of the city because of the planned developments, because of the planned uh, urban regeneration projects. And this is an example of a chance to rescue some of these buildings. Do you remember this kind of architecture in these buildings as a small child whilst you were here? Um, my great-grandmother's house was very similar to this one. It was a courtyard house with rooms around the courtyard. Does it influence the way that you design now? Architects here in Qatar tend to uh, be very no nostalgic about these different architectural elements that you find more about, the ornamentation. But I think there's much more to learn from a house like this. For example, the proportions of the liwan or the, the sort of colonnade around the courtyard in order to get enough shade. Things like that that we should extract as lessons that we can use. Despite the improvement in Doha circumstances since the discovery of oil and gas, some things remain unchanged. The hot weather can make this an inhospitable environment, and climate change is only likely to make it more so. Doha's modern buildings cannot afford to ignore this. A project like Mesherib that's upcoming right now, there are so many architectural lessons that we can learn here, which we can call Qatari contemporary. Um, which, are, which do not really look traditional. However, they do respond to the context very, very well. I really respect the fact that an architect did not find the need to have another fully glazed elevation. Therefore, the building requires less energy to cool. And at the same time, the elevation together with the poetry that's engraved on it gives a character to the area. So do you think there's a common story that the region is trying to tell to the rest of the world? With the resources that it's, it's, it's got its hands on right now, uh, they're trying to develop a solid basis to their cities. 
what's being built today is not just for me or for my younger brothers and sisters, but it's for future generations to come. Mesherib's 900 homes, offices, and shops aim to recreate the close-knit communities of the 1930s. At a cost of five and a half billion dollars, it's a substantial gamble on luring people back from the suburbs, something the towers have failed to do. The popularity of Doha's recently rebuilt souk shows that there's a strong sense of nostalgia for the old town. I've spent so much time here looking through my lens at buildings that it's easy to forget that this is all about people. Qatar, perhaps because it's a nation built on immigration, understands clearly the competition for human resources. A competition not only with its fellow wealthy Gulf states, but the wider world. There are precedents for this. To attract people, the competing city-states of Renaissance Italy use their wealth to glorify their cities with painting and sculpture. To be successful, you sometimes have to first appear to be so. Art that depicts a human form remains controversial in this part of the world. The beautiful buildings suffer no such drawbacks. I guess, seen from this perspective, Qatar's ambition is not to create an instant city, but an eternal one. London is, on the face of it, just such a metropolis. It became the first truly international city of the modern age, more than two centuries ago. But today, it too is being radically redrawn by the global economy. <laughs> Neighborhoods that were once the home of the British elite are today second homes for the international super rich, creating a central core which increasingly feels to me like a ghost town. At the same time, London is seeing record growth, its population jumping more than 100,000 in 2013, the highest increase since World War II. The residential property market also rose 20% in the first six months of 2014, driven to a large degree by foreign money. Across the city, new buildings are rising, fundamentally reshaping the skyline. These changes have not been without controversy, but from a time-lapse photographer's perspective, it is exhilarating. I spent six long weeks in this hotel in 2012 for the Summer Olympics. And I say long weeks because to wake up every morning to a building, I'd been aching to photograph for, for all that time. But knowing that working seven days a week, 12 hours a day, I simply wouldn't have the energy or the inclination to go and shoot after work. You know, I made a mission in the back of my mind that one day I'd be back. From here, you know, it's talked about as being this huge, huge building, but for me, it actually fits in really quite neatly. The Shard became Europe's tallest building. As a photographer, to capture something new, 
something that's the world's biggest, the world's tallest, the world's best, is always part of the story as well. The Qatari-owned skyscraper has drawn a mixed reaction from the press. One commentator described it in graphic terms as having slashed the face of London forever. Not because it offends British sensibilities to have a foreign-owned building dominating the skyline, but because of a perception that it changes the character of London. A straw poll of commuters down on London Bridge suggests a sharp division in people's attitudes. What do you think about the shard? The shard, I don't know, it's a bit, bit of an eyesore, to be honest with you. For me, one of the best buildings in the world. It's expensive, it's just kind of pointless, maybe. Really. <laughs> it's really cool and uh, very futuristic, that's for sure. According to the local council, only 11 residents wrote in to object to the shard. Looking out over London from the 72nd floor viewing platform, it's hard to believe it was so few. The only meaningful intervention was by English Heritage, the body tasked with preserving the country's historic sites. It objected to the effect this new landmark would have on an old one. St. Paul's Cathedral. A $16 million inquiry decided in the Shard's favor and it went ahead, enthusiastically supported by London's mayor. For me, what makes this all the more significant is that it sits at the vanguard of 236 tall buildings set to transform London over the next decade and there has been almost no public debate about this radical reshaping of the city. New London Architecture, an organization whose sponsors read like a who's who of the building industry, has put together an exhibition detailing exactly how London will look if all the proposed buildings go ahead. What opposition has there been to these types of buildings? Well, there have been comments, for instance, from some people that uh, we don't want something like Dubai on the Thames. London, of course, is very different. We have a lot of historic buildings, and we need to insert new tall buildings into that uh, historic environment. Should St Paul's dictate London's planning uh, in the future? I think using St Paul's as a guideline is a pretty good way of stopping buildings in particular historic areas. But I think we've also got to look at places where, not just where we can't build tall buildings, mm. but places where we can. Mm. Because London is growing hugely at the moment. We're 8.3 million people, but mm. by 2050, we're going to be more like 13 million. So we've got to build a lot more housing, a lot more places to work, more retail, all sorts of things like that we, we, we need to do to meet that growth. And a part of that is to build taller buildings, create denser urban centres. The last time London's skyline was this radically redrawn was during the city's bombing in World War II. St Paul's famously survived as a symbol of national resistance. It's an icon twice over, built on the ashes of the Great Fire of 1666, which burned a third of the city to the ground. Its architect, Sir Christopher Wren, who knew a thing or two about building and longevity, wrote, Architecture has its political use. It establishes a nation, draws people and commerce, and makes the people love their native country. Architecture aims at eternity. Great cities need great buildings like these to define themselves. St Paul's was a prestige project, a skyscraper in all but name. At over 100 meters and perched on top of Ludgate Hill, it was the tallest building in the capital until 1962.
Before the 60s, London was essentially a low-rise city. Six storeys was in practice the limits for both Victorian plumbing and the amount of stairs tenants were prepared to climb before the invention of the elevator. So London spread out, not up. At over one and a half thousand square kilometers, urban sprawl is no longer the answer. According to the developers, the only way is up. Renzo Piano, the Shard's architect, has described his building as a vertical city. But with 10 apartments costing up to $80 million each, it's unlikely to solve London's housing shortage. This is MI6, uh, which you'll know from the movies. Terry Farrell is part of a golden generation of British architects who've had a profound impact on the cities of the modern world. The world population is rising and rising at a phenomenal rate, and most of those will be urbanites. So placemaking through cities and being proud of your city and making recognizable architecture, I think is happening all over the world. And a lot of that does lead to mistakes and, and to inappropriate tall buildings. There's a lot to be said for the tall building. Uh, the tall buildings of New York create the busy pavements, the busy sidewalks. It's not just tall buildings, though, it's density. And that's why you get such great shops and great sidewalks and great restaurants. Do you believe societies are defined by the buildings around us? Well, it's uh, Churchill's great quote, wasn't it? Uh, we build our buildings, no, we make our buildings, then our buildings make us. Cities can be organic by nature. Should they be organic? I, I believe inevitably change in uh, in city form and in architectural direction is essentially organic. I've often said cities are the greatest work of art and they're anonymous in, in a way. They are made collectively, which is extraordinary, really. I can see the argument for saying our buildings shape us, but I'm unsure that we shape our buildings. It seems to me that money is now doing that. London needs to expand, but skyscrapers are not the only alternative. They raise issues like no other buildings. They shape our cities both visibly and structurally. And I think Londoners have little idea of how much these buildings will affect them. That's perhaps the reason I'm finding more questions than answers here. If you want to know about skyscrapers, there's one obvious destination. By happy coincidence, a time-lapse paradise. Shooting time-lapse in a huge city, of course, has its risks. And as somebody who's on their own, you kind of get this, yeah, a sense of loneliness, but also a sense of being able to not be distracted by anything else apart from what you see. And you can feel the hairs on the back of your neck standing up when you reach the top of that building and get that great view of the city. And you know that time-lapse is going to help you achieve that by creating that sense of hyper-reality. New York is a time-lapse photographer's and certainly architectural photographer's paradise. Everywhere you go, there's a shop. Few cities divide opinion more than New York. A towering celebration of modernity for some, for others, including one of Europe's greatest modernist architects, Le Corbusier, a beautiful catastrophe of elite spires soaring above the poor.
New York didn't give birth to the skyscraper, but with 22 square miles to build on, it was always going to be a vertical city. Two things changed the face of modern construction. The invention of steel-framed buildings, which meant that a lower wall no longer needed to bear the weight of the walls above, and safer elevators. Six stories had been the practical limit of most buildings prior to the 1880s, and the necessity of trudging up six flights of stairs made their upper reaches the home of the poor. The invention of the elevator inverted this hierarchy. From now on, it would be the rich who lived at the top. And for New York's elite, the sky really was the limit. For me, New York created what we imagine a modern metropolis to be. The New York skyline is what new cities around the world aspire to, whether consciously or unconsciously. When America's enemies wanted to attack this vast country, they chose to attack the New York skyline, specifically its tallest buildings. Thirteen years later, their successor, One World Trade Center, is nearing completion. The architect chosen in a public vote to come up with a master plan for this site was in many respects a quintessential New Yorker. I was an immigrant to New York, and there's something so amazing about arriving by ship with all the other immigrants from all countries, looking at that uh, silhouette and saying, my God, this is, this is like seeing something out, out, of, out of the moon. It's, it's not possible that people have built this kind of magical city. New York is the best school of architecture, the city itself. As you look at the streets, as you look the way buildings are being built, as you look at the density of New York. And you see how hard people work in New York. That teaches you a lot about architecture because architecture is more than meets the eye. It's more than the glory of building a building. It's, it's what is life? What kind of life does it represent? And what does it contribute to people's lives? Louis Sullivan, the father of American architecture, in his 1900 speech to the New York architect said, you know, New York City has one God, the God of money. It, nothing has changed in, in 100 years. New York is city driven by money, by ambition, by we want to build this, we want to build this. But how do you, with, if you build a private skyscraper for your clients, how do you contribute something to the city? You have to make some gesture to the public, like Woolworth building. Uh, I mean, they spent a ton of money on the, cube, on, the, on the spire of Woolworth, which was Mr. Woolworth's office. After all, it was just a private office of a millionaire. But it's something glorious. It's, 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 it's like a church. It represents aspiration. Chrysler Building has the, that incredible sort of needle that was put onto it at the very end. So I think there's a lot to be said that within this private world of uh, money, there was an ambition to, to add a civic dimension to it. And I think that's part of what makes New York still a very, very interesting city, as opposed to many other cities that have a lot of tall buildings, but so what? New York's grid system, initially brought in to facilitate the parceling out of land in simple blocks, also lent itself to tall buildings. For me, it gives the city too much order. Perhaps the reason I'm so drawn to these spots where Broadway, the pre-existing Native American trail, intersects with the rigid monotony of the grid. Built in 1902 by one of the pioneers of the skyscraper, the flat iron building still feels modern. It's been described as resembling the prow of a ship sailing up Fifth Avenue. Its shape, maximizing the use of the triangular plot,
created by Broadway. As Daniel says, a functional building, but a beautiful one too. The golden age of the skyscraper was also the great age of American expansion. In 1800, New York had a population of only 60,000. By 1900, it was a million. In the 1920s, it overtook London as the largest city in the world. When the New York stock market crashed in 1929, the city already had more than 180 buildings over 20 stories high. The patron of the last megastructure of this era, John J. Raskup, reputedly gave his architect a simple brief. Build as high as you can without it falling over. The result was the Empire State, the tallest building in the world for the next 40 years. Known in the trade as the empty state for its commercial failings, it was nevertheless a vertical statement with which no one in New York or elsewhere for that matter could compete. In the shadow of the Empire State is the office of an economist. He's drawn parallels between the economic imbalance that led to the 1929 crash and the situation today. One of the fascinating things is that we got into this mess by overinvestment in housing uh, and overdevelopment of housing and speculative development in housing. Uh, we've stabilized the problem by urbanization in China, which is overinvestment in housing and overinvestment in urbanization. If you look at the property markets around the world, and London is overinflated. New York is overinflated, and to me that means you're going to get back into the mess very shortly. How do you think we can break that cycle? Uh, one of the ways in which we can break it is uh, to actually start to rationalize the, the investment uh, in urbanization. And in order to do that, we have to spend much more money investing in affordable housing for ordinary people. But that then means that ordinary people have to have the money to pay for it which means that actually you've got to get employment back uh, to a position where people have an income stream where they can afford a uh, decent house and a decent living environment. What is stopping the pot from boiling over right now? What's keeping the lid on? Actually, the lid is off in many parts of the world. We've seen just in the last year eruptions in several cities in Brazil. Uh, there has been unrest in Stockholm. And before that, there was London and Paris. And so there's a lot of unrest in urban areas out there, uh, which I think is going to be very, very difficult to manage as, as time goes on. If there is trouble brewing, it doesn't seem obvious in New York at least not in its commercial epicenter, Times Square. This was a high crime area for more than 50 years following the Great Depression. But today, it has a very different vibe. It feels like a cathedral of consumerism. People come specifically to see the flashing lights. Photographing them and each other with the same smartphones advertised on the billboards. Another left-leaning academic has labeled this pacification by cappuccino. As long as we have our branded phones and branded coffee, we're content to ignore the bigger picture. When America began to find its feet after the Depression, it was a boom driven by the same consumerism, and New York was at its heart. Both the buildings and the way they were built had changed, but not the staggering amount of money patrons were prepared to spend. The Seagram building on Park Avenue cost more per square meter than any previously built. The cult of the architect had also begun. Few people know who built the Empire State, but the architect now became as important as the building. The Seagram's creator, Mies van der Rohe, and his contemporaries 
but to bring in the age of the architect as an icon, the Starkitect. These modernists and their patrons had very little sentimentality, and many of the city's historic buildings were torn down. The monolithic Pan Am building, now renamed MetLife, was stuck on top of the delicate facade of Grand Central Station. The station itself barely escaping the wrecking ball in a city where money was still the only god. I guess it still is. New York prides itself on being the city that never sleeps, the financial capital of the world. I can't help but wonder if that's what's going wrong today. So many cities seek to emulate New York without understanding the sacrifice this entails. But there's no doubt that architects are captured by, by money. Here you, are, you need money to build a building, but money is not the only thing that should drive architecture because we see the fatality if architecture is only driven by money and only by private developers' ideas, then the cities are going to become ghost towns because only the rich will be living in the centers of cities and everybody who actually works in the center of cities will live in, in some boondocks away and the cities will be empty at night and there'll be just investors in, you know, who live far away whose empty apartments have no light. Uh, it's not a good idea. After all, that's what a city is. It's a creative place. That's why people want to be in a city. They can get jobs, they can go to school, they can better themselves, they can meet other people. So if you segregate, you create a horrible dichotomy that will be a failure and will lead to a, a, the end of cities. New York itself may be changing. The original World Trade Center was an incredibly controversial project. Its detractors accusing it of ignoring the people on the pavements in its race for the sky. The same failings critics point to in today's megastructures. Its replacement has consciously taken a very different route, involving the public right from the start. My experience at the competition for Ground Zero at World Trade Center, which was a world competition with thousands of architects and millions of people being involved online and saying, I like it, I don't like it, was really a symbol of the fact that architecture has become participatory, that in an open society, architecture doesn't belong to anyone. I mean, someone may, may invest in it, but it's part of the city, so everybody, every citizen has a right to comment, to steer architecture, Concentrate on the streets. Concentrate on open space where people can sit down. That's why half of the site of Ground Zero are streets, piazza, public memorial, the museum. So you can't design a city just for one class. You have to design it for everyone. I think that's part of the social justice that a city represents. Ours may well be an urban planet, but it's wrong to assume this is an irreversible process. Cities should come with a warning. Just as they rise, so can they fall. These were once thriving neighborhoods, homes people spent a lifetime paying for, taken back by nature, dense housing demolished and reverting to grassland, what has become known as the urban prairie. No city has fallen further or harder than Detroit. It's become the poster child for urban decline. The Michigan Central Train Station it is unfortunately a building that a lot of the national and international media have come to uh, cast as a symbol of Detroit's plight, of the problems that the city's going through. Um, for me, it's just ruin porn, to be quite frank with you. Uh, this is, you know, the story of Detroit and Detroit's issues are much more complex than, than what you can understand just by looking at the train station. 
The problems in Detroit are not Detroit's problems. They're American problems. This is an American city, a great American city. So when you're talking about a wholesale withdrawal of governmental support for industrialized cities. And, you know, I think that the flag being near the train station is quite appropriate because, like I said, this is not just a symbol of Detroit's plight, but this is a symbol of America's plight and neglect of places like Detroit. Detroit's recent history might be one of decline, but this was, as Darrell says, a great American city. It was also an instant one. A population of 285,000 in 1900 reached almost 2 million in 1950, fueled by the needs of one industry. Deindustrialization is a common issue in the developed world. My own hometown of Nottingham in the UK went through it in the 1980s and 90s, but Detroit's problems started long before that. In creating the motor car for the mass market, Detroit sowed the seeds of its own decline. When the car companies wanted to create new production lines or wanted to teach unionized labor a lesson, they just moved further out of town, taking with them the jobs and the tax revenues the city needed to survive. At the same time, the freeways and cheap cars suburbanized Detroit just as they did the rest of America. It was a long, slow death. The auto industry's relationship with Detroit seems a strangely unbalanced one, as does its relationship with the country as a whole, neatly summed up in the saying, what's good for General Motors is good for America. When General Motors filed for bankruptcy in 2009, the US government stepped in to help. What was good for GM, though, was not necessarily good for Detroit. When the city filed for bankruptcy in 2013, no federal support was forthcoming. The bankruptcy has hit people here very hard. You know, we've been driving around here, and I've been looking at the cars people are driving. Mm -hmm. They're all American cars. People here love the auto industry a whole lot more than the auto industry loves them. You know, Detroit has always been known as a place where you could come, get a job, and own a home. You know what I mean? Now, you, you can't do either one of those things. And so what we got was we got a housing crisis. We got a mortgage crisis. We got a meltdown of the housing market. No city was as harshly affected uh, by that as Detroit was. Even when the president comes to visit Detroit, first, the only place he ever goes is to the car factories. Because, you know, it was his idea to bail out GM, and so, uh, you know, a big part of uh, his victory narrative is that I saved, I saved the car companies. Well, you didn't save Detroit. I wonder if you can save a city. It seems to me that you can't make people come to a place. You can only make it a place people want to come to. No one is more aware of the problems facing Detroit than the people who live here. I think what frustrates them is that too often the media chooses to illustrate the problems through their ruined buildings and not through their ruined lives. So, you, know, you both worked all your lives, you paid your taxes, and now you're retirees. How have things changed in that period? Shortly after we retire, we find out that uh, we're going to be uh, cut from our pension, is going to be cut. I'm almost 60, and say, we're going to have to take 30% of your income. That's a big, it's a huge, in, it's a huge increase. I'll have to file bankruptcy. I mean, we're looking right now, do we need to sell our house? It's not fair. Wow. This is what happens to senior citizens. It's the same story for you? Same story, but I think a, a, a different slight twist because I was forced into retirement. There were so many other ways we could have recouped these funds. It's almost like they're going after the last vestige of wealth left in this city. Do Detroiters need to reclaim the city of Detroit as their own? There are a lot of vacant land in the city of Detroit that you can build on. There are a lot of vacant properties, a lot of vacant factories. Somebody has to be a champion for that. That's what I said. What we need is not just a simple mayor. You have to have a coach. A coach is going to cheat 
treat Detroit like it's big team, then everybody's gonna have an opportunity, and that's what we need. A stone's throw from the ruins and closed municipal buildings, you could be forgiven for thinking that this was already happening. The heart of the city has been given a brand makeover. Detroit's makeover is, however, just that. Few of these people live here. They commute from the suburbs or attend conventions or come to watch baseball. London and New York are cities where the core has become too expensive. Detroit is a city where it's become too cheap. Parts of the center have already been reclaimed by people attracted by the low cost of living. And there are signs that investors are starting to renovate the derelict buildings, anticipating that this will continue. Some have pointed to this as a new beginning, but I'm not convinced it's any more significant than the ruins. The graffiti looks suspiciously corporate. Real street artists tend to make their feelings known a little higher off the ground. If there is a true symbol of Detroit, I like to think that it's the fist of Joe Lewis, one of the greatest heavyweight boxers of all time, who moved to Detroit as a teenager. It's one of my favorite time lapses because until I began to work on it, I had no idea it was an object in motion. Lewis said, every man's got to figure to get beat sometime. Which is of course true, but it's what you do afterwards that really counts. Cities have always been in motion. They have to be to evolve and adapt. What I think is different today is the speed of that change, something which I fear is excluding us from the process. Now more than ever, we must consciously shape our cities, because if we don't, on this urban planet, it's our cities that will shape us.